is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jamie Owens. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. China cuts rates, jumpstarts the world's second largest economy amid concerns of a slowdown. Our other headlines, avoiding a war in Europe and a Russian invasion of Ukraine. America's top diplomat in Berlin for another frantic round of talks. Aid starts to arrive in Tonga. We hear from people on the ground struggling for clean water and food supplies in the aftermath of the tsunami. Shanghai pulls ahead in its drive to make autonomous taxis part of everyday life. China has cut its mortgage lending rates for the first time in two years. Its central bank has reduced prime rates for one- and five-year loans, which have a direct impact on home mortgaging costs. It should bring welcome relief for the property sector, which has been suffering a funding squeeze, resulting in a number of developers defaulting on their debts. Well, let's talk now to Helena Huang, a China economist at ICBC Standard Bank. Thanks for being with us on the program, Helena. So uh, this looks like good news for the somewhat troubled property sector. How will it affect homeowners and potential home buyers? Yeah, pleasure to join today. So essentially, I think today's move of the LPR rate that mimic very well of the previous cut we've seen on the LMF uh, rate earlier announced earlier this week. So this is pretty much within a market's expectation. And because this time, not only the one-year uh, uh, LPR rate uh, was down by 10 bips, the five-year also were cut by five bips as well. So that means for homeowners, whoever is applying for mortgage for, for the banks, um, they will have a slightly cheaper rate to pay for. Uh, that's clearly encouraging. And at the same time, it also helped to restore a revived sentiment, particularly for the real estate developers, as those who are uh, with a slightly healthier balance sheet um, who want to uh, uh, apply for credits or re re apply for additional loans from the bank, they will probably get a slightly uh, less burden as well as a big, on the back of this lower um, lending benchmark rate. But overall speaking, I think um, this is, the cut itself has more meaning in terms of restoring or reviving the sentiment in the domestic market rather than injecting loads of uh, liquidity direct, directly into the market itself. So you think this will boost sentiment then? Do you think this could us usher in a new boom in the housing market? Um, I think overall speaking, the rhetoric around housing is for living, not for speculating, that still d didn't change at all. And although the Evergrande stories or the other defaulting stories are off the radar at the moment, the story itself hasn't ended at this stage. So therefore, it's very difficult to um, foresee a, a, another booming sort of section of the real estate sectors to come through. It's more about Perhaps we are right now at the really very bottom of the uh, of the cycle itself, and the sentiment was really very um, sort of on the pessimistic side towards year end last year. And therefore, right now, through on the back of these policy uh, marginal easing stance, we are uh, hopefully going to see a bit of improvement in the sentiment going forward, and activities are likely to pick up a little bit as well. But that that having said that, that doesn't really mean that we are expecting to see another booming session to come through. It's just probably a very gradual recovery, recovery from the previous um, downward trend. Okay, Helena Huang from ICBC Standard Bank. Thanks very much indeed for talking to us today. And we'll be at the New York Stock Exchange later to see how that rate cut in China is affecting stock markets around the world. First, the rest of today's news, and Europe is on the brink of a war, and America's top diplomat is in Berlin ahead of crisis talks with Russia. There is growing concern over a possible invasion of Ukraine, with U.S. President Joe Biden saying he expects his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, to move in. Well, in a moment, we'll talk to CGTN's correspondent Stephanie Fried in Ukraine. First, our correspondent Trent Murray in Berlin. Trent, uh, what's the latest on those talks in Germany? 
Well, Jamie, uh, diplomats are desperately trying to defuse tensions uh, on the Ukrainian border as the number of troops there increases. Uh, latest estimates suggest that up to 120,000 Russian troops are now sitting on the Ukrainian border. And the warnings are from Washington that conflict really could erupt at any moment. So it's against that backdrop that Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is in town talking to his German, French and British counterparts, trying to send a very strong and united message. Speaking at a press conference this afternoon, German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock said any further aggression by Russia will have grave consequences. She went on to say that she urgently calls on Russia to take steps to de-escalate the situation. A very similar message from uh, Anthony Blinken. Uh, he is trying to send a, a strong message to the Kremlin that Washington and Europe are united on all of this. Let's just have a little bit of a listen to what he had to say. We have been very clear throughout. Uh, if any Russian military forces move uh, across the Ukrainian border and uh, commit new acts of aggression against Ukraine, um, that will be met with a swift, severe, united response from the United States and our allies and partners. President Anthony Blinken might be uh, clear, but there is some confusion about President Biden's uh, press conference just some hours ago. Some analysts are suggesting President Biden's comments on Putin moving in on Ukraine are uh, a strategic mistake, a strategic gaffe. Uh, I wonder what's been the reaction. Uh, yeah, I mean, it certainly has raised a lot of eyebrows uh, in Europe and I think in the US for that matter. He went on to say that while he thinks Putin may move in, it would likely be a minor incursion. Those were the words that have caused uh, quite a bit of concern and confusion because essentially it breaks from the very unified message NATO has been trying to project that any sort of incursion, regardless of whether it's big or small, uh, would be seen as an aggressive act. That clip we just played of our Secretary Blinken, I thought the language was very interesting because he was a lot more specific in trying to, I suppose you could say, clean up this mess, this confusion. He said uh, any aggression or crossing of the Ukrainian border would trigger a response, clearly trying to uh, send a message that it doesn't matter whether it's big or small, Washington will see it as an aggressive move. Of course, an important player in all of this as well, the European Union, uh, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has also been speaking about this. She also sending a strong message that the EU will be willing to uh, punish Russia if indeed it attacks Ukraine. If there are any further attacks on the territorial integrity of Ukraine, we will respond with massive economic and financial sanctions. The transatlantic community stands firm on this. The European Union is by far Russia's biggest trading partner and by far the largest investor. And yes, this trading relationship is important to us, but it is far more important to Russia. And, of course, this whistle-stop tour of Europe by Secretary Blinken really uh, is being uh, built up to tomorrow. That is being billed as the main event in all of this when he sits down face-to-face -face with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, to discuss what Moscow calls its security concerns. It is expecting a list uh, of demands to be responded to already. NATO says some of those demands uh, are simply non-starters, and yet Secretary Blinken says the meeting with Sergei Lavrov in Geneva is a sign that in all of this, uh, democracy and dialogue is not dead. Trent Murray, our correspondent in Berlin, thank you very much. Well, let's bring in Stephanie Fried, who's in the Ukrainian city of Slovyansk. So, Stephanie, where you are is very close to the Russian border. What's the atmosphere like? Well, um, you know, we're hearing, as we just heard, the alarm bells are sounding um, 
in Ukraine, outside of Ukraine, among world leaders around the current situation, the crisis here in Slavyansk. Uh, you could say people are conflict-weary. This was the first city to be taken over by Russian-backed uh, separatists back in 2014. Then the Ukraine army took it back from the separatists. But this is close to other areas of this entire region. There's been ongoing shelling, sniper fire since that time. And people here are skeptical. They say they're not really seeing uh, Russia, a Russian invasion. They, some people that I talked to said that they feel that if it was going to have happened, it would have happened already. Um, and at the same time, Ukraine's president in Kiev uh, is accusing Russia of trying to stir up chaos within Ukraine, and he's appealing for calm. Let's take a listen to what he had to say to the people of Ukraine on Wednesday night. No, 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 no. Ukraine doesn't want war, but we must always be prepared for it. We must not be afraid. We must protect our land and never give up. We have nowhere else to run. And then, Stephanie, tomorrow we have these crisis talks in Geneva between the United States and Russia. What are the expectations surrounding that? Well, you know, we, we just heard Trent talking about the bottom lines um, from both sides, from the U.S., around NATO, from Russia. Um, and so it would seemingly appear also after last week's talks between the different sides in Geneva, three rounds that met with deadlock, that, may, that there wouldn't necessarily be any movement on Friday. However, also, as Trent said, this is diplomacy. They are still sitting down face to face trying to reach some sort of agreement, possibly. Um, but taking into account, again, the Russian buildup, the, uh, the personnel and hardware buildup along Ukraine's borders that increased just in the past, in the previous days, also moving into Belarus, which is perceived as another threat on another front, um, there is a, a good amount of concern. Eyes will be on those talks tomorrow to see if there possibly is the chance of a breakthrough. Robin. Stephanie, thanks very much. Stephanie Fried there in Slovyansk. China and Germany should remain a model for bilateral cooperation. That's according to China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi, who's been talking to his German counterpart, Annalena Baerbock, for the first time since she took office. The two countries will mark 50 years of diplomatic relations this year. Wang urged Germany to expand cooperation with China on trade and climate change. China says it has warned away a U.S. warship which it says entered its waters in the South China Sea. A military spokesperson says the USS Benfold was in the area without permission, accusing Washington of violating its sovereignty. The U.S. Navy denied the ship had received a warning and said it was conducting a freedom of navigation operation. The territory is contested by China and Vietnam. You're watching CGTN still ahead. Fasten your seatbelt. Hope you're sitting comfortably. U.S. airline results next. We're landing in New York in just a couple of minutes. Beijing. China's capital and its cultural nerve center, a modern metropolis with traditional roots. And now it becomes the first city in the world to host both summer and winter Olympics. After 14 years, the biggest sporting extravaganza returns to Beijing. Thousands of athletes from around the globe will compete in over 100 events at three zones. Cheered on by over 1.4 billion Chinese citizens, and millions abroad. CGTN will bring you a ringside view of the historic event. 2022 Beijing Olympics, the games that matter on CGTN. See the difference. This week on Razor, Guy Henderson meets the scientists who are working to revive the underwater kelp forests along the UK's coastline and bring back its biodiversity. This is a small experimental area, but if we can prove that the removal of trawler pressure itself results in a rewilding and a regeneration and a recovery of things like fisheries for local fisheries and so forth, then it's an, it's an argument for doing it everywhere.
Welcome back to Global Business Europe. Just a reminder for you that CGTN is available to watch for free on all the major digital platforms, on Smart TV or online on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube and Dailymotion, CGTN.com and the CGTN app and in the UK on Freeview. Let's take you back to our top story and uh, Hong Kong stock markets got a welcome shot in the arm with China's decision to lower key mortgage rates for the first time in nearly two years. Uh, it lowers some of the pressure on China's property developers who are struggling to repay massive debts. Wall Street is also ticking slightly higher. Let's talk to our correspondent John Terrett watching events for us in New York. John, first of all, uh, good news on those uh, stocks in Hong Kong. I wonder what's the reaction been there? You know, Jamie and Robin, I was going to, when I heard that we were going to do this story today, I was about to disabuse you folks over there of the notion that just because China does something, the stock exchange here reacts to it. And then I found out that actually there has been a really interesting reaction to this interest rate cut in China. And it's easy to understand, which is pretty good. And ironically, it affects the Chinese ADRs, which are the American depository receipts, the Chinese stocks that trade here in New York. And you're quite right. Some of them did very well off the back of this announcement in Hong Kong a few hours ago. And it's happening here now as well, because when China lowers its interest rates in order to boost the economy, and as we heard at the top of our program today, bringing good news potentially to homeowners in China, to some property developers in China and around the world, a potential mini boom, I think we were talking about at the top of the program. It means here, risk on for buying Chinese stocks again. And so this is exactly what has happened. Uh, risk on tends to favor the high growth stocks. And so here in New York at the moment, Alibaba is up 5%. And the company that is close behind it, its rival, JD.com, is ahead by some 10 percent. And this follows on from you know, similar stock increases that we saw, particularly where those techs are based in Hang Seng in Hong Kong. Now, I spoke to one Wall Street analyst this morning who actually is living at the moment in Kansas City, Missouri. Can you believe that? Working on Wall Street, but living in Kansas City, Missouri, right in the heartland of the country. And the word is that there's more easing coming, that the two cuts we saw yesterday, the one on Monday, I think there was something in December as well, because the Chinese economy is in need of a bit of an uptick at the moment, then there is more easing to come. That's the word on the street. So there's likely to be more buying. But of course, as I've said to you before, it comes with great risks. OK, it comes with broad risks and people here know and understand that they understand and look at Didi, for example, which is down 40 percent since its IPO back in July and Didi, which is now decamping back to China, leaving the New York Stock Exchange. That's a classic example of things that you simply can't control if you invest in these companies here. But anyway, the move by the Chinese government on rates, certainly rekindling the fire for the ADRs here. That's the top line from New York. It's intriguing, isn't it? Because China cutting rates when other economies like the United States are under pressure to raise rates. So explain to us why the yes. difference in America? It's all to do with the cycle. And I don't mean the kind of contraption that you ride to work every day. I mean the fact that these two giant economies are in different locations in their annual cycle. Now, as you know, the U.S. economy is in need of some TLC when it comes to the present situation regarding inflation, which I'll come on to in just a second. Clearly, the Chinese economic cycle is in a different place, and Beijing feels the need to trim interest rates at the moment. Here, it's all about the Federal Reserve, the central bank, raising interests rates, and potentially quite a bit this year. Now, we began this inflation story on the program at the back end of last year, hearing from the Federal Reserve that inflation in America was transitory, which means it'll go away soon. Now we know it's not transitory anymore, and it seems to be bedding in. And the Federal Reserve is now saying, look, it's way above our target of around 2%. And the real question, actually, which is being asked a lot here, is, you know, why did the Federal Reserve get it so wrong and maintain to that transitory line 
for so long when clearly everybody else knew differently. So rates are going to rise in America in 2022. They've just got to end the asset buying, the $120 billion that's been going on every month. That ends in March. Then we're expecting one interest rate hike, potentially two more. I'm hearing maybe even four this year now. And I'm also hearing talk possibly of a cheeky little half point interest rate hike even before they finish the tapering in March. All of this will only bring us back to the level that we were of interest rates around about the boom time for the economy when President Trump was in power before the COVID outbreak happened almost two years ago. But the lack of knowledge about what's really going on has been hobbling stocks. It's been a terrible couple of days here. But in keeping with the Asian stocks, after the Chinese interest rate cut, we are now significantly up with the Dow ahead by 1.2%. The Nasdaq, which was flirting with correction territory yesterday, is ahead by 2% now, and the S&P 500 ahead by 1.4%. But, of course, we, th this lack of knowledge about where the Federal Reserve is going, what's happening with inflation, they'll probably be down tomorrow, quite frankly. Quick word before you go, John, on airline results. Uh, United yes. and American reporting yes, yes, the yes, sector's yes. had a terrible time. What can you tell us? Yeah, very briefly, just to catch up on the 5G news, I see other airlines are cutting flights now, trimming them. BA, Lufthansa from Europe among them. Japan Airlines says that the 777 has been cleared by the Federal Aviation Administration to fly in areas with 5G. And the administration has also boosted to 62 percent now the number of commercial jets in America that can fly with 5G near to the airport. Earnings last night, United, bigger than expected, lost $646 million, cutting the capacity forecast. They say rising fuel costs and Omicron are likely to hobble the business and they reckon that the first quarter revenue is going to be down 20 to 25 percent compared to two years ago in 2019. American just released theirs this morning, a way narrower than expected loss for the fourth quarter. They say revenue will be down 20 percent compared to where it was in 2019 in the first quarter. So to sum it up, United says the first quarter is going to be tight. Americans rather more optimistic, but they both cite headwinds and that would be Omicron and labor issues, of course. Guys. John Terrace in New York, over and out. So a cut for China's interest rates likely rises in the United States. Meanwhile, in Turkey, the central bank ended its latest policy meeting by keeping rates unchanged. That brings an end to a series of rate cuts which began last September and saw the lira crash. CGTN's Mikhail Bardavid reports from Istanbul. On Thursday, Turkey's central bank held this year's first monetary policy meeting. The central bank announced it's keeping its benchmark interest rate unchanged at 14 percent. This was in line with market expectation. However, Turkey had cut rates by 500 basis points since September last year, aiming to lower inflation, which currently stands at over 36 percent. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has been pushing for rate cuts to fight inflation, and the central bank has followed his unorthodox views. Erdogan hopes to boost production, exports and employment. However, many economists stress that a policy U-turn is needed to tackle with the country's inflation issue. The government hopes to lower inflation to single digit by the end of this year. Meanwhile, Turkey has been struggling with a currency crisis, as the lira lost about 44 percent of its value last year. The government has been taking some measures to support the economy. A monetary policy scheme was introduced in December that protects lira investors from forex depreciation. Erdogan announced that 163 billion lira has been deposited into such accounts, roughly worth 12.2 billion U.S. dollars. Turkey has also signed a nearly $5 billion swap deal in local currencies with the United Arab Emirates. Markets will next be watching out for Turkey's quarterly inflation report due to be published by the Central Bank on January 27. I'm Mikhail Bardavid for CGTN in Istanbul. Meanwhile, Japan is dealing with stagnant wages and creeping inflation. But instead of raising prices, the country's food manufacturers are recouping their costs elsewhere. In other sectors, though, prices are going up. Phoebe Amoroso reports. Among the rows and rows of snacks and sweets lie hidden price rises. Consumers buy the same product in the same package, but they won't get the same amount. It's a trend called shrinkflation, and some people are keeping track. These are a flavored version, but the original version of these snacks were 260 grams until 2007, but now they've decreased to 190 grams. 
In 2016, the price also increased, and so they've become comparatively more expensive. Iwasa's website Neage, literally price increase, tracks changes to products' weights and prices across popular products and chain restaurants. I've always loved sweets and bought them often, but when I saw that products were clearly getting smaller, I wanted to share that with other people, and that's why I started this blog. Wages in Japan have remained stagnant for almost three decades. This means many manufacturers are reluctant to pass on the costs to consumers. The COVID-19 pandemic has pushed up the cost of commodities, and a weaker yen is also making fuel and imports more costly. Japan's wholesale prices for December accelerated at the second fastest pace on record, up 8.5 percent. Consumer prices are following suit, rising at the fastest pace in nearly two years in November. Last year, this popular beef bowl restaurant raised the price of a regular bowl for the first time in seven years. From next week, a pack of these potato snacks will be three grams lighter. But the manufacturer says that it is also raising prices on a variety of its other products. It says that it has received more negative feedback over shrinking packets as opposed to price hikes. It looks like Japan is starting to be upfront about its inflationary future. The Bank of Japan has reportedly begun discussions on messaging about a future rate hike, although any increase remains a long way off. It's still far from its 2% target. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has promised to drive forward the economy by raising wages to raise consumption, but some are skeptical about whether current measures will be enough to break the cycle of low salaries and weak consumer demand. Kishida's plan includes tax credits to accelerate wage increases, so he seems to be focusing on raising wages. But on the other hand, the primary balance surplus is also a concern of his, as is fiscal consolidation. If we continue like this, the demand stimulus measures are only limited, and if anything, this will turn out to be a rather austere fiscal policy. So I believe a real recovery of Japan's economy will be difficult. If wages don't go up, analysts warn that consumers will close their wallets. And the Bank of Japan's inflation target will remain out of reach. For sweets manufacturers, they might find themselves still caught between raising prices or shrinking the packets. Phoebe Amoroso, CGTN, Tokyo. Unilever appears to have abandoned its move to acquire the consumer arm of GlaxoSmithKline, refusing to raise its $68 billion bid. The initial offer was rejected by GSK, which said it undervalued their brands and prospects. Unilever says it's committed to ensuring that acquisitions create shareholder value. 27 drug makers will be able to make low-cost versions of Merck and Co's COVID-19 treatment pill under a deal backed by the United Nations. More than 100 emerging economies will be supplied with means to produce the drug, which is almost 18 times cheaper than buying the normal pill. Merck will not receive royalties. Workers in the UK are preparing to go back to the office after a change in government COVID guidelines. People are no longer being advised to work from home. Standard Chartered, Citigroup and HSBC are among major banks preparing for staff to return. Some other banks say they'll pursue a hybrid model of working. You're watching CGTN still ahead. Relief flights arrive in Tonga. We speak to families tr frantically trying to establish contact with loved ones after the tsunami. It is now important that all of us in Europe act very swiftly. Fines for the non-vaccinated will most likely be between $1,000 and $4,000. The new Omicron variant circulating in Southern Africa. The financial markets have also reacted badly to the news. Growing dissatisfaction with the way the Dutch government is handling the pandemic. Cancelling the city's main public Christmas markets for the second year in a row. Protests and riots by those opposed to restrictions and vaccinations. There is no room for complacency in this ongoing battle against COVID. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda.
agreement is signed. But what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU? For trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people. Make sense of Brexit with CGTN. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with global business, only on CGTS. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Robin Dwyer. Our top stories, avoiding a war in Europe and a Russian invasion of Ukraine. America's top diplomat in Berlin for another round of talks. Aid starts to arrive in Tonga, but scientists are warning that further volcanic eruptions could be on the way. And China cuts rates to jumpstart the world's second largest economy amid concerns of a slowdown. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson's efforts to hold on to his job are facing another setback, with his supporters accused of intimidating and blackmailing critics within his own party. It follows a string of allegations over parties held at Downing Street when the country was in lockdown. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent, Nui Jabarkul, in London. So, Nui, this story just won't go away for Boris Johnson. What's the latest? Yeah, Robin, just when it seemed like the pressure may be easing on Boris Johnson last night in terms of fighting off this potential rebellion within his own party, these fresh accusations really uh, risk uh, compounding the problems for the UK Prime Minister. William Ragg, a senior member of the Conservative Party, also a vocal critic of Boris Johnson, that must be said. He says that some other lawmakers in the party are facing uh, blackmail potentially and intimidation from their own colleagues. Uh, several forms this is taking. One, he said, was the idea of bad publicity, which he specifically uh, said staff at 10 Downing Street were uh, potentially involved in, as well as uh, allegedly senior government ministers. Aside from, uh, from that, funding seems to be the other uh, method that uh, uh, Mr. Rag claims is being used, uh, potentially telling uh, lawmakers in the Conservative Party that unless they fall in line and back the Prime Minister, that funding may be cut for their areas. Uh, Christian Wakeford, uh, yesterday he, in dramatic scenes, decided to leave the Conservative Party shortly before Prime Minister Boris Johnson began talking and crossed the House and sat in the Labour Party benches, the opposition benches. He says that this is something that he has personal experience of, uh, apparently funding for a school in his local area was apparently targeted by the whips. Those are the people who uh, essentially push forward government uh, legislation in Parliament. Here's a bit more about what William Ragg had to say earlier today and uh, where potentially this leaves the Prime Minister. The intimidation of a Member of Parliament is a serious matter. Moreover, the reports of which I'm aware would seem to constitute blackmail. As such, it would be my general advice to colleagues to report these matters to the Speaker of the House of Commons and the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. And they're also welcome to contact me at any time. So potentially uh, legal ramifications here as well. Uh, as Mr. Rag mentioned, there uh, people being advised to contact the police if they had any concerns or were apparent victims of this blackmail or intimidation. We have heard from the Prime Minister. He's come out and said that this is all news to him. He hasn't seen any evidence of this. Here's a bit about his response earlier this afternoon. I've, I've seen no evidence, heard no evidence to support any of those uh, allegations. Anushka, and what I'm focused on is what we're doing to deal with the number one priority of the British people, which is uh, coming through COVID, uh, and we've made enormous progress thanks to the to the vaccine rollout, fastest in uh, in Europe, the booster campaign. 
And the Prime Minister there insisting that this was uh, something that he would look into, asked if he will uh, investigate the claims, he said, of course. Now, as far as the Prime Minister is concerned, he's asking his colleagues in the Conservative Party to hold off until that investigation by a senior civil servant called Sue Gray is concluded. Uh, we're hearing that that could happen sometime next week. Uh, the results of that, of course, will be uh, looked at by the Prime Minister. He's the ultimate arbiter of the ministerial code, which uh, judges the behaviour of uh, senior ministers here, including the Prime Minister himself. So the likelihood of him uh, taking on board what Sue Gray says and then uh, meeting out any punishment, especially if uh, fingers are pointed towards Downing Street and these parties, which has really triggered a lot of this uh, rebellion here in the Conservative Party. Uh, some within the party think that that might be a tall task. Aside from that, though, the Prime Minister, you heard, uh, he mentioned uh, Plan A. That's because here in England, Plan B restrictions have been eased. Uh, three uh, three elements essentially to, to the plan B. One was working from home. That's been scrapped and moved. People asked to get back to their offices. I've been walking around here in uh, Westminster in central London and to be honest uh, that message hasn't really got through yet. The streets here are still very, very quiet but lots of businesses will be uh, breathing a sigh of relief, particularly um, those in, in, in the financial district, as, as Jamie touched upon before we, we came to this report. Uh, aside from that, masks in public places, they're set to go next Thursday, as well as COVID vaccine passports, perhaps this is the most controversial issue in this Plan B restrictions. Uh, they're set to go next Thursday as well. In terms of where the UK stands, though, in infection rates still near uh, record highs, well above 100,000, 108,000 was the latest in the 24-hour per period. And now that these restrictions have been ease. There is a warning from scientists as well as the World Health Organization that one factor that hospital admissions may be plateauing, one big factor that, that in that is the behavior of ordinary people. And if these restrictions are lifted, then we could see infection and cases spike again. Julia, uh, Robin, Jamie. Noija Balko, thank you. Aid is starting to reach the tsunami-hit island nation of Tonga. Experts from New Zealand's foreign ministry say more eruptions are likely. The death toll currently stands at three, although it could rise as recovery operations continue. At least 50 houses were destroyed on the archipelago's main island. One key concern is the lack of communication with the island nation as an underwater cable was cut by the disaster. Well, China has joined a number of countries sending aid to Tonga. It's donated $100,000 in funding, plus water, food and other emergency relief supplies. China has promised to continue to provide assistance and ensure further relief is delivered as soon as possible. The supplies were handed over to Tonga's Deputy Prime Minister. Thank the People's uh, Republic of China and Your Excellency, your good office, for offering us with the, this uh, relief food and drinks donated by your government, uh, which is uh, the first donation uh, of, of this kind that we receive uh, for this disaster. Yu Hongtao is a Chinese national working and living in Tonga. He spoke on the phone to Xi Jia about the extent of the damage. There is just dust everywhere. You have to wear masks when walking out on the streets. Otherwise, it will feel like your mouth is full of ash. What I've seen so far is everyone involved in emergency rescue and disaster relief operations. The ground is covered in ash, including vegetation and people's houses. Some volunteers have been cleaning up the roads, but not yet in the woods. Electricity has been restored at the moment. It was cut off when the volcano erupted. Then it was restored in many areas the following day. After dawn, on the day of the eruption, everyone restocked on supplies. I personally stocked up on water, and then food, and more water. We have enough supplies here. There isn't any bottled water at supermarkets now. What is the current state of telecommunications? How are the internet and phone signals? There are two communication companies here. We have no problems contacting each other on the main island here in Tonga. We were able to make a call to China yesterday, but I've had difficulties connecting just now. We don't have internet access at the moment. I heard it won't be restored for a short while. Talita Kifu is from Tonga but lives in San Francisco and uh, I think we can uh, see her now and that's baby Tonga by the way whose uh, bedtime we're uh, disrupting. Welcome to you both. Talita, first of all, have you been able to make contact with your family? Did they witness the tremors of the volcano, the ash from the volcano, uh, the wave from the tsunami? 
Uh, good morning. Thank you for having us. Uh, I have been able to make contact with my uh, with my family. My sister called me uh, Sunday here in the U.S. just to uh, inform us that they're okay. And I was able to speak to my uncle yesterday um, as well. They're just starting the cleanup back home. But um, all things considered, the family are well. And uh, they didn't witness the water uh, flooding coming in. But uh, obviously everyone on the island heard uh, the volcano when it erupted and they were able to send me uh, videos before communication got cut off of when it was starting to um, rain volcanic uh, ash so it was it was a fright for everyone but i'm just really thankful that my family are well and safe and can you tell us what is their current situation with regard to clean water supplies food uh, and power uh, from my understanding power has been restored to some some areas, which is uh, which is wonderful to hear, so they can charge their electronics, um, so we can keep in touch with them. Uh, as I've heard from the previous reports, there's some communication. So, uh, just knowing that other families now can call in to see the status of their to hear of the status of their loved ones um, has been good. When I when I spoke to my uncle yesterday, he did mention that water is an issue. Um, they are getting drinking water delivered to them from humanitarian. Um, organizations on the ground, uh, like Red Cross, uh, the local His Majesty's Armed Forces are also delivering water out to families. Um, from the report I saw from New Zealand, the Speaker of Parliament is mobilizing uh, with the Tong community there, uh, seeing the water shortage. But obviously, obviously the with, the, um, with the volcanic ash, uh, Tonga being largely a subsistence economy, uh, the agriculture has been um, damaged and affected so food shortage will be an issue uh, but it's just wonderful to see all the all the foreign countries like uh, china new zealand and australia um making their way over to donga with water supply and relief uh, relief supplies as well so that's that's really amazing to see and for people who don't know about this region it is worth saying isn't it the tonga is only just really emerging from that last awful natural disaster uh, that's right. That's right. And Tonga is very prone to cyclones, uh, not so much tsunami, although uh, we've had a tsunami a couple of, um, well, several years back. I think it was 2009, but it didn't reach the main island of Tonga Tapu. Uh, it was just the outer islands of Niwa. So uh, this would be a first of its kind, I, I can say, uh, given the size of the eruption and the significant damage uh, coming out from the satellite images um, of what's happening on the main island of Tonga Tapu. I'm really hoping to see more uh, reports coming up from the outer islands, but considering the death toll is still at three, uh, I really hope um, the damage and the fatality is, is still uh, significantly low. Talita Kifu, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. And uh, Tonga, sorry for uh, keeping you from your nap. Thank you both very much for coming on the program. All the best to you and your family back home. Thank you very much. Our French teachers have gone on strike, accusing the government of failing to protect staff and pupils against COVID-19. They're angry after it emerged that the country's education minister announced those rules and restrictions for schools while on holiday in Ibiza. Let's talk to our correspondent, Ryan Thompson, watching events for us in Paris. Uh, Ryan, what more can you tell us about this? Hi there, Jamie. Well, this saga has been going on for a number of weeks now. It really started with the decision that rules would be eased for students and parents in terms of how they need to self-isolate and if they need to be picked up at the end of the day. It really, the idea being that at a point when nearly 2% of all classrooms across France were not meeting in person, the government needed to do something to really ease the burden on the parents and on the students. But teachers say this has put them at risk. And so for the second week in a row, they took to the streets of Paris and other big French cities today to really voice that complaint. Last week when they met, they did see some degree of concessions from the education ministry. They came out saying they would provide those FFP2 masks, extra protection to the teachers, and they would also look to bring in uh, extra support, extra bodies into school to really beef up the numbers to ensure that teachers aren't really facing such a burden. But adding insult and really a huge flames to the fire this week, the news revealed by the French uh, publication Media part that the education minister, Jean-Michel Blanquer, was actually announcing these rules while he was on holiday in Ibiza. Ryan Thompson in Paris.
Thank you very much. Meanwhile, teachers and pupils in Greece have staged a second walkout in 10 days against the government's COVID testing and isolation protocols. Unions say the rules are ineffective and are severely disrupting classes. Our correspondent Evangelo Sipsas reports from Athens. The streets of Athens filled up once again with teachers, parents and students as unions call for another national strike. Thousands gathered and marched towards the Greek parliament who showed their opposition in what they say are inadequate coronavirus protection measures in their schools. They say that these latest measures are ineffective. Basically, the latest measures haven't really changed. The government hasn't given any additional funds to fight the pandemic in hospitals and schools. This year's budget is lower. How is that possible? More and more hospitals are closing down. Instead of giving more money, the government's putting the blame on us, saying we are not following the measures, so we are responsible for the spread. It's entirely their fault. Unions are demanding the government provide teachers and staff with more protective FFP2 face masks, more ventilation in classrooms, and also testing on site rather than at home, where it relies upon parents testing their own children and then writing a statement that the child is negative. The teachers also criticize the government, saying it has not followed through on many of its promises, such as providing masks, but most importantly, providing replacement staff when teachers catch the virus. Parents' unions also criticize the government measure that says a classroom must close only if over half of the class is positive. Rather than wait until that point, many parents keep their children at home to avoid an outbreak. As parents, we agree with our children staying at home. We said it many times and we will continue to say it. We need more parents out there to take action and change these measures. Government figures show almost 46,000 new coronavirus cases this past week, 40% more than the week before. And a quarter of those were among students at universities and schools. As the country is experiencing record level highs of coronavirus infections, parents and teachers are calling for the government to go back to the initial protocol that saw an entire school shut down when there was a single positive coronavirus case. Evangelos Sipsas for CGTN, Athens. You're watching CGTN still ahead. Pictures at an exhibition. We're off to a gallery in London with one of China's leading contemporary artists. So this is it. I'm just about to be shot. Friends here. Bottles are being thrown as they do so. Uh, there are about three critical <laughs> bridges <laughs> here in Malawi. That's one of them. We're going to cross that bridge. As you can see behind me, police forces who are replying with gas. Get gas to the tear gas. So it's all begun now. Divisions leading the charge into West Mosul have brought us here. Just got to be careful here with some gunshots. This is where most of the fighting has been concentrated. It's the front line now after nine days of fighting. We're about two to three kilometers from Within the front line. clear view of this front line position. Murray, what would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Europe. British police have arrested two men in relation to a hostage-taking siege in the U.S. state of Texas. Malik Faisal Akram, a British national, took four people hostage at a synagogue over the weekend before he was shot dead by police. Two teenagers previously arrested in connection with the case have been released without charge. Ghislaine Maxwell has requested a retrial after she was convicted of sex trafficking. Her lawyers want the case reheard after one of the jurors told the media he used his own experience of sex abuse to influence the verdict. 
Maxwell, who is a close friend of the convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, was found guilty last month on five counts, including trafficking a girl. South Africa has declared a national emergency after weeks of heavy flooding in several parts of the country. Rescue services have been stretched with homes and businesses inundated by rising water, while key infrastructure has been damaged. A formal declaration of an emergency frees up government funds for affected areas. The former Pope Benedict ignored allegations of child abuse in the 1970s and 1980s, according to German investigators. A report commissioned by the Catholic Church says he failed to deal with cases involving four priests who were found to have abused children. The former Pope previously denied awareness of the crimes. The Vatican said it would examine the report when it was officially published. One of the world's largest icebergs has added around a trillion tons of fresh water into the world's oceans as it melted. Scientists say they're still trying to assess the environmental impact of the iceberg, known as A68. It broke away from Antarctica in 2017 and by early 2021 had completely dissolved. Now, no more grumpy taxi drivers who never stop sharing their colourful views. Shanghai is accelerating the introduction of self-driving taxi services. A number of car makers are testing their vehicles in the city, seeking to tap into a potentially lucrative market. CGTN's Chen Tong reports. By simply opening an app, you can order a cab without a driver. Verify your identification on a screen in the back seat and you are ready to go. During the journey, you have access to the air conditioner and can even check the status of the drive. The ride-share experience for autonomous driving cabs is no different from the usual. There are safety drivers on board, but they are hands off the steering wheel unless there is an emergency. Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation is one of the companies involved in testing. Its so-called robot taxi is operating in the city's Jading district and has as many as 40 cars. The company hopes to expand its services nationwide to about 200 cars by year end. It's got some steep competition in the marketplace, however. Internet giant Baidu and artificial intelligence firm AutoX have also been testing their self-driving cabs in Jading. And even food delivery firm Meituan is investing in related businesses. They say the commercialization of the industry has still some way to go, but slowly getting there. It would definitely take a while to fully commercialize the service, but just how long depends on how many services we can provide during the experiment. The more services we can provide, the faster we can reach. Shanghai authorities say they are fully behind the effort, and they are giving it as much support as they can this year. Experts say it's a green light for more research and development, as well as moves toward regulation. We will need to have a very high requirement, uh, especially on the infrastructure support and also on the regulatory part, and even uh, for the ecosystem partners, for example, how do you claim, let's say, if you get into an accident uh, without uh, any, let's say, safety officer in the car, uh, whether uh, the insurance companies are supporting that claim, so topics like that. Consulting firm IHS Market says China's autonomous driving technology could be worth as much as 35 billion U.S. dollars by 2030, with an annual growth rate of more than 20 percent. Such a big market plus China's large demand for traveling means a solid regulatory framework is needed. The Ministry of Transport says all of this is included in the government's current five-year plan for economic and social development. Chen Tong, CGTN, Shanghai. One of China's leading contemporary artists has opened his first solo exhibition in London. Wang Gongqing has assembled a series of works using, among other things, swinging light bulbs and video cameras to explore the differences between his native China and the United States. Catherine Newman reports. After more than two years of waiting, the first solo exhibition in London by Chinese artist Wang Gongxin has opened at the White Cube Contemporary Arts Gallery. 
The 13 multimedia works presented in In Between investigate the differences between Wang's birthplace, China, and the United States. And during an era of isolation and self-reflection, such exhibitions play a crucial role. Art has always been about escaping solipsism, getting out of your own head, and for a brief moment maybe seeing the world through somebody else's eyes. And as we've spent a lot of time with ourselves over the last couple of years, I think art uh, is as important as ever. And I think Wang Gong Xin's exhibition is, is extremely timely and extremely poignant. As you notice, there are no human forms in the work, yet it's very much about consciousness and the human condition. Swinging Grey is one piece that is hard to miss, through which Wang explores indeterminate, changeable states, both physical and perceptual. The piece consists of water splashing between two pools so that neither remains completely black or white. I require, I require the space uh, to have two doors and two entrances. There's a camera, and depending on the entrance you take, if you stand in front of the black side of the sink, and your image will appear on the wall you are facing now, and you will see your image in the 20 television monitors. If you go into the space and stand up in front of the white part, your image will be displayed on the other wall. The water also splashes on the floor, so if you stand too close to any black or white part, your clothes will become dirty. Using black, white and grey, the pioneering artist reflects upon distinctions between inside and outside, artificial and natural, and individual and collective. Wang says that a lot of his work is also based on uncertainty. So how did the pandemic affect his creative process? From the start of the pandemic in 2020, when these works were almost complete in my studio, they still need minor adjustments, because I mean, as an artist, if the work is still in front of you, you will never be satisfied. If they have a chance, I believe all artists will constantly adjust their work. Wang Gongxin decided to use the pandemic to his creative advantage, tweaking many pieces in the interactive exhibition. The coronavirus pandemic has hit the creative world as it has other industries. While putting on an exhibition such as In Between does require more back and forth than in pre-COVID times, the buzzing atmosphere here today at White Cube shows that the art world is back in full swing. Catherine Newman, CTTN, London. The headlines again, avoiding a war in Europe and a Russian invasion of Ukraine. America's top diplomat in Berlin for another frantic round of talks. Aid starts to arrive in Tonga, but scientists are warning that further volcanic eruptions could be on the way. China cuts rates to jumpstart the world's second largest economy amid concerns of a slowdown. That's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all of our stories at europe.cgtn.com and do follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're on smart TV apps, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube, Dailymotion, cgtn.com and the CGTN app, and in the UK on Preview. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. From all of the team here in London, goodbye. Bye.